My name is Corey Hart. I'm an education specialist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. And today, this is part one of a four-part series called Scat and Tracks. As part of this series, this is designed for elementary age students, like yourself, hopefully. And you're going to go out uh, with your teacher after this video and look for signs of the critter that we discussed. So each week, we're going to be focusing on a different uh, species that we have in Vermont. Today's species that we're focusing on is the gray fox, which is a really, really neat species. Uh, but before we uh, start to highlight the gray fox, first I want to talk a little bit about Vermont Fish and Wildlife. The mission of Vermont Fish and Wildlife is the conservation of all plants, wildlife, and, and, and their habitats for the people of Vermont. The way we complete that mission is through a lot of staff. and We have five divisions. We have an outreach division, which is who I work for. We have a wildlife division, fisheries, administration, and our warden service. Today, as I mentioned before, we're focusing on the gray fox. But before we do that, there's some key things we have to know first before we go out in the woods. And the first is this phrase that you just heard me say a minute ago, and that's habitat. Well, what is habitat? Every single species, including us, or myself, has a habitat. My habitat that I live in is completely different than that of a gray fox's. But we need the same basic things. So when I think habitat, I think of four things. And the first is food. Everything needs to eat something. So this morning, I got up and I had a nice big egg sandwich before I came to work. You think a gray fox had an egg sandwich? They probably didn't, but they might have eaten mice, insects, or other critters. I also require water. While I might have gotten water out of the sink, uh, gray fox are going to find the water through other sources. It could be a spring uh, out in the woods. It could be a creek. It could even be a puddle. They can get it through a lot of different uh, types, of, types of areas. So, so far we have food, water. Then our, our third thing that we all need is shelter. So we need some sort of shelter. All critters uh, need it in some shape or form. So myself, I live in a house just like you do. But our gray fox, they don't live in a house. They have a form of a house though. So they live in, in dens. Or it could be burrows. It could even be underneath a down log. So we have food, water, shelter. Our last item that all animals need for their habitat is space or arrangement. And that's how all the three things I just mentioned before are arranged. Some critters need their food, water, and shelter spread out over a long area, meaning they have a really long range that they like to travel. Other animals have their food, water, and shelter in a really close-knit area, meaning they don't travel very far. They need everything really close. For myself personally, when I get up in the morning, I don't want to tra travel 20 miles to go get my food. So everything's really close for me. Gray fox, though, on the other hand, might travel distances. They're not going to go miles, but they might go several acres. Uh, and it all depends on the habitat around them, too. So some are going to travel further than others. In Vermont, we have two species of fox. We have red fox and we have gray fox. Today, we're going to be focusing specifically on the gray fox. To ID them, they look very similar. There's one key characteristic, though, that really helps us to tell them apart. And that's by actually looking at their tail. So with the gray fox, on the very end of their tail, you're going to see that it has a, it's tipped black. With a red fox, this is actually going to be tipped white. Looking at the actual body can sometimes be tricky to tell them apart. Because you'll see right now, this actually looks a little bit light. You can see the very defined gray here, but it's still really kind of brightish. Whereas red fox typically are going to be more kind of a, a reddish brown but they can look like gray fox on the actual coat themselves, which is why the best way to tell them apart is looking at that tail. And you, got a, you can see a really, really nice black tip. The fox himself weigh only about 8 to 15 pounds. So gray fox are a nocturnal species, so we see them, which means we're going to see them out at round at night. So typically you're not going to see gray fox here in the day because that's not when they're out and about. They're out and about during the evening hours, and at night. One thing that makes them extremely neat is they're the only fox species that actually climbs trees. 
So they might go up and snag like this. So a snag is what I refer to as kind of a dead tree that's still standing. So this is something they might actually go up. And they're going to go up there for a couple of reasons. They might go up there to hunt because they are a predator. Uh, in terms of the habitat they, that they like, uh, gray fox are typically found in this type of habitat. So it's a habitat, if you see behind me, it's typically hardwood forest with some softwoods mixed in. So hardwoods are going to be things like maples, oaks, and when I refer to softwoods, I'm usually referring to things like pine trees or, or trees that have, have needles out all year long or that stay green, known as evergreens. So gray fox are a crepuscular species, meaning that they're, they're most active in the evening and early morning hours as well as at night, so during the nocturnal hours. During the day, they actually den up, meaning that they're going to go to a den site where they're going to spend the daytime hours. And their dens vary. It might be something like a cavity in a tree like we have here. And it's usually going to be lined with leaves and other things on, and, or bark on the inside. Or it could be down um, a cavity in a bank. So other types of habitat that they like, similar to what we were just talking about a second ago, are the, you find them typically around streams, areas like that, as well as overgrown fields. So in those type of environments, you'll typically find areas where there might be a, a down spot underneath a, a stream bank or things like down logs and things like that, where they can get up underneath and that, that's where their den site will be. Gray fox are a territorial species, meaning they have a range of about a mile that they're gonna stay within that range. Their diet consists of plants and animals. So gray fox are what are referred to as an omnivore, meaning that they're gonna eat both plants and animals. Near and th throughout the year, their diet actually changes with what's available. So they're gonna eat things like rodents, insects but they'll also eat uh, different plants and stuff that are available so if they're in an area around an old field or an active field they might eat things like corn apples and even things like acorns and stuff like that that are in the woods that are readily available so their diet kind of mixes up as the season goes on so the breeding season for gray fox is february to march and but during their mating period gray foxes are actually known to fight other males. So males will actually fight each other in competition for the females. Uh, their litters, once they have the litter, are one to seven pups. So the pups are what we refer to as uh, the young. And when they're only a year old, they're ready to reproduce, meaning they can have young of their own. So when born, the pups are actually blind and dependent on the parents for survival. And the male fox will actually stay with the female uh, during that period when they're young. At about three months, they're able to get up and, and go and hunt on their own. And the pups will remain with their family uh, until the fall. And then they're going to go off on their own. And the next season, so we're, uh, in February, March, then they're going to go off and breed on their own. And then the cycle continues. So in Vermont, we have a really strong population of both gray and red fox. And we manage them a couple different ways. Uh, through both a hunting season and a trapping season. So trapping is a highly regulated activity here in Vermont. Uh, there's been a ton of studies done in co collaboration with state biologists and trappers to come up with the most humane uh, traps possible, which allows us to actually still go out and harvest the, the animal in question. So in this case, gray fox, while making sure that we're being as humane and as ethical as possible. So we're at the point in the video now where we're gonna start, start discussing the types of sign that you're gonna find when you go out and you look for gray fox. So remember, the first thing that you wanna do is we gotta look for the types of, the correct type of habitat. And the correct type of habitat is up a hardwood forest uh, with a little bit of softwood thrown in. You might wanna look kind of along a stream bed or if you have an old field in the back of, the, back of your school, that's another good spot to, to check. So somewhere that hasn't been mowed in like eight, 10 years, something like that, is a great area to get started. So for the types of sign that we're gonna find, primarily we're gonna be looking for scat and the tracks. So first we're gonna start with the tracks. So the tracks of the gray fox, when you're looking for them, you're gonna see them one after the other. So they're what are referred to as a walker and a trotter. So you're gonna have one track and then there'll be another one a little bit further up and then another, just like you see on the screen right there in front of you. Uh, on the back of the track, you're going to have the rear paw. There's going to be four almost like thumbprints. And then you're going to have 
four look claws that come off the thumbprints and they're going to be separated by about this much so just a little bit's going to separate them uh, and depending on the type of area that you're in you might have a difficult time finding those prints so if you have snow that's going to make it a lot easier for you if not in an area like where i am right now i'm probably never going to be able to find the actual tracks because they don't weigh very much they're a species that always only weighs about 8 to 15 pounds so i would want to look maybe along a stream bed or an area where there might be some mud where their tracks would actually get captured. Another type of sign that I'm gonna be looking for is their scat. So I have some scat right here in my hand. So again, this is the plastic scat. This isn't real gray fox, but this is very similar to what it might look like if I found it out there in the wild. It's not very big. So typically their scat is only gonna be about two inches long or so, uh, but it is usually a little bit more stringy than this type of scat that I have in my hand. And it varies too, based on what they ate. So you think about it, gray fox eat a lot of different things. So if they eat a mouse or they eat insects or different vegetation, there might be, uh, their scat might be a little bit thicker or a little bit stringier, depending on what they ate. It's not like other species that eat the exact same thing over and over so that their scat is gonna be identical. It's gonna vary, which can make it a little bit trickier for us to ID it. One of the other things that you're gonna be looking for when you're out there on your hike is gonna be potential den sites. While I don't expect you to find an actual gray fox den, you're gonna be looking for areas that might work as a den site. So right here next to me, this would actually be an excellent den site. So this is just an overturned log, and you probably can't see it on the camera, but you can go in a couple feet right there, and that would be an excellent location. So as you're out there on your hike, you're gonna be looking for areas that might have overturned logs, cav cavitations, so maybe a big hole in a tree like we showed you earlier, or maybe a hole in the ground or under a bank. So right here in front of me, I actually have a nice little steep bank. And if there was a hole here, that'd be an excellent spot for a gray fox den. So now it's time to actually get out there with your teacher or your parent and go and look for signs of the gray fox. Remember, when we're out there looking, it's really important uh, to try to stay on the trail. And if you go off the trail, to separate uh, so that we're not making a direct impact. Because if we all walk single file in, our, in the same line, uh, that's going to have a negative impact and, and start to actually form our own trail. We don't want that. We want to make it look like that we leave no trace that we actually went out in the woods. Well, get out there and have some fun.